Welcome to the Case Autopsy, the Verdict and Settlement Podcast. With your host, Mike Campbell. Case Autopsy is part of the family of podcasts brought to you by Lawyer Minds. In this podcast, we explore recent verdicts and settlements from around the country to try and distill down the best techniques for you to apply in your cases. Here's your host, Mike Campbell. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Case Autopsy. I'm your host, Mike Campbell. Uh, rolling solo today. Tad is out, and Chris is preparing for a trial. He just got a, a massive verdict with his cousins uh, over in St. Charles County, and so we're looking forward to having back, him back on to talk about that. Um, but I actually am joined today uh, by uh, Gus Lookingbill, high school student here in uh, Columbia, Missouri. Gus, say hello to everyone. Uh, hello, I'm Gus. I'm a junior at Hickman High School. Gus, you're shadowing today because you want to be a lawyer. That's right. Uh, and so what what are you interested in when it comes to, you know, the law? Is it is it because you're a history guy, right? Yeah. You like world history. Yeah. What's your favorite, uh, you know, world history topic? Um, I am really into a lot of the classical history you know the roman empire yeah. ancient greece so that fits right with the law right yeah we we say a lot of fancy uh latin terms that most of us don't know what they mean yeah yeah so gus when he gets his law degree can explain it uh, all that stuff to us uh we have uh, what i consider to be some of the best trial lawyers if in the Southwest, if not the whole country, uh, coming on today to talk about a fantastic result they got for a very deserving client, uh, Rick Barrera and Adrian Vega. Um, Gus, I'm excited about this. You excited? Yeah, can't wait. All right, let's let's get it going. You're listening to the Case Autopsy, the Verdict and Settlement Podcast. Podcast. This is Mike Campbell. All right, I'm joined uh, today with Rick Barrera and Adrian Vega of Buckingham Barrera and Vega. Uh, guys, how's it going? It's going good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been a while since I w- we were in Albuquerque. How are things in uh, How are things in Albuquerque? Are you guys there today in the office there? It's hot, uh, but it's monsoon season, so so we're getting some glorious rain. I like it. Rick, where are you at? Are you are you in Albuquerque right now? I, I'm in Albuquerque as well, which I think is funny because uh, I, I think the weather's been a little cool since uh, I, I come from Texas. And so um, when he's saying it's hot, I'm like, oh, this is like actually mild. <laughs> it's a dry heat. That, that it is. So uh, real quick, uh, you guys handle serious catastrophic injury cases, medical malpractice cases. Um some of the best lawyers, not not just in the country, but definitely in the Southwest. Can you tell us a little bit about your practice and what what type of cases and other things that you, you guys work on? So we'll handle, you know, anything catastrophic in in many different fields. So whether it's it's birth trauma, um, auto product defect, product liability, medical malpractice, uh, Rick and Kent. Uh, our partners are are really big in the oil and gas. Uh, you know, Rick just had a, a, a really big resolution in a um, oil and gas death case um, just a, just a couple of months ago. So really runs the gamut, um, but specializing in catastrophic injury and wrongful death. And it seems like Rick, really big result, uh, Brera should be his name because uh rick you have what was it a, a record setting verdict i think in uh new mexico we do but here, here's the main thing I, i'm always part of a team so it's not uh it's not always my it's not just me yeah. um yeah we do our firm does have the largest medical malpractice verdict um, in new mexico the second largest i believe ever in new mexico um, in 2018 so um Adrian's case had the potential that if it actually went to trial, could have beat that one. And we were kind of hoping that that was going to happen, that we were going to get to go to trial, and then that uh, our firm would have both the, the largest and the second largest um, med mal verdicts um, in New Mexico. 
I mean, it's incredible. I'm, I'm, I think your clients are very fortunate to have you guys work on their cases. And Adrian, you had a really difficult, uh, you know, tragic case. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Give us the factual background. Yeah. So, so this was uh, a young child who had a congenital heart defect and was seen uh, in a local heart program for pediatrics. And um, when, when they undertook to treat him, uh, a, a device had embolized and migrated into his aorta when it needed to be repaired surgically, uh, uh, recovered surgically. Uh, the surgeon was was unavailable at that time. And um, the client suffered a spinal cord stroke and a brain injury as a result. But the, the, the kicker in all of that was really there was an opportunity to repair it um, surgically. And the surgeon was unprepared for those textbook procedures um, to, to repair it from the get-go. And that's what set him up for that catheterization that went awry. Ultimately, when that surgeon did show up and was able to recover the device that had migrated into the little boy's aorta, uh, he recovered it in six minutes, and then he performed that textbook procedure that he should have done uh, months and months before all of this. And so the the case was entirely preventable. Um, and and that's what I think made it so so tragic and, and impactful. And when the family came to you, you um you look at the case, uh what kind of experts are you thinking about you're you're gonna need for a case like this? So you know, when the family first came to me and we had that conversation, um, the first thing that went through my mind was, you know, this is something that should not have happened. And and so I look at it from the perspective of, you know, how am I going to uh, unravel this story, start learning the facts and and decide on what avenue and what path we need to take? Um, to to discuss it with my experts, um, and and truth be told, I you know you talk about case framing. Well, I had framed the case um, based on what I knew at that time, and that it was you know according to mom and and family, an an interventional catheterization procedure that had gone awry in the cath lab, and the surgeon was unavailable. And there needed to be surgical backup and surgical assist for these interventional procedures. And um, I had a heck of a time finding anyone that that would support that from a multitude of uh, pediatric uh, cardiac specialists, whether it was the general pediatric cardiologists, whether it was the highly specialized pediatric interventional cardiologists, But especially the pushback uh, I was getting from the, um, you know, super highly specialized pediatric cardiothoracic surgeons. And so what I had to do many times was go back to the drawing board to reframe the case in order to get an expert on board. Um, It wasn't my first pediatric uh, cardiac case against a heart program. And so I had some connections that I had made as a as a really early baby lawyer a couple of years out of law school. And and I utilized those connections um, who gave me enough information, but still wouldn't support the case. And and so I'd go back to the drawing board um, and was ultimately able to reframe it in a way um, to get, you know, one of the one of the top pediatric cardiac surgeons in the world and um, one of the top uh, interventional uh, uh, cardiothoracic, um, I'm sorry, one of the top pediatric interventional cardiologists uh, in the world as well um, to to support the case and round it out. So you, in, in your heart, in your soul, you know, something's wrong. 
you know that something could have been prevented and you, you know, I, I know with these medical malpractice cases, once we get pushback from experts, it's like, man, maybe we got to, you know, move on. You go back to the drawing board, it sounds like a couple of times to make this case, frame this case in such a way that the experts can, can get on board. That's that's remarkable. And, you know, I, I remember where I was. Yeah, I remember being on uh, my poor kids. I remember taking them to Maui. I was in big vacation in Maui and I got out of the pool to take this phone call that I'd been waiting on for so long. And it was uh, another pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon telling me that he can't support the case, you know, and I'm, I'm like, oh man. Um, okay. So back to the drawing board on that front, but the, ultimately the way that things came together um, was when I, when I reframed the case to be a um, really a, a nationwide problem with cardiac uh, centers that are now opening up um, cath labs. So, you know, there was a movement, I think, in the pediatric cardiac world where there's a lot of diagnostic caths, uh, I'm sorry, diagnostics that are being done. There's a lot of echocardiograms that um, general cardiologists are are performing and looking at. And they didn't have they either didn't have a surgeon on hand to refer those patients to, or they didn't have a cath lab to make repairs um, um, in, in that manner, interventionally, percutaneously. And so they started opening them up and, and there was a consensus statement um, at some point that came along that said, look, if you're going to be having um, percutaneous procedures in a cath lab, then you must have a surgeon available to repair um, some of those complications that may arise in the cath lab. And um, ultimately, it was one of those consensus statements that helped me reframe the case to get my uh, interventional cardiologist on board. And because of his status and, and where he was within you know, this highly specialized arena, um, I was able to then uh, help convince and persuade other experts that are at the top of their field to get involved. Um, and so that that was kind of how I got my foot in the door. That being said, um, I also remember where I was when my the, the expert I'm talking about, the interventional cardiologist, told me I don't have a case mm -hmm. and, and walked away. And, um, you know, I, I stayed in contact with him and would bug him about once every six months and say, hey, I'm still here. I've, I've got this angle. Let's talk. Let's talk. And, and was ultimately able to convince him. And it's, it's highly specialized. So you're having to frame it for your experts. But and my guess is you're probably thinking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, how am I going to frame this for a potential jury? Because this is really complicated stuff. And so... Um, you know, what, what were you thinking about? I, I know you got the case resolved, but I'm sure you were thinking about that, right? H how am I going to make this easy for a jury to understand? What, what's that? What's going into your thought process there? So my thought process at that point was, um, you know, I, I, I need help. Um, and, and this is where, you know, having good partners comes in and, and running focus groups in order to, um, to really try to narrow down what everyone is focusing on because there are so many facts and the case in and of itself, you know, there was, there was a lot of really uh, sexy material, just a lot of things that make you say, well, that shouldn't happen and that shouldn't happen. And, and this shouldn't be happening. And, you know, can hospitals do that? Is that, is that how they run things? Um, ultimately in a, in a focus group that uh, Rick and I had run, um, earlier on, a lot of that came down to just communication. You know, a, a hospital's got to have communication systems in place at, at the most basic levels. And and the way that that was kind of expounding as we got closer to trial was the communications has to be on, on the proper diagnosis. Um, you've got to make sure that within these 
um, uh, surgical catheterization conferences where all of these highly specialized cardiologists, interventionalists, and surgeons are meeting that, that they are conveying the, the child's proper diagnosis, the textbook methods to repair it, and an overall treatment plan. And when something goes awry, like it did in this case, how do you communicate whether there's going to be surgical availability? Um, in, in this particular instance, when that device did, did migrate to the child's aorta, um, the, the surgeon had another, uh, another child in the OR um, who was on cardiac bypass in an elective procedure. Mm. And so, you know, there's, there's this quandary of, well, we need you up here, but you've got another pediatric patient downstairs. There's only one surgeon available at this institution that can, that can come in and, you know, where is he? Well, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big communication failure on the part of, of any hospital system, but especially one with, with pediatric patients. And so you, what the feedback you got was you had a, a necessary procedure, an elective procedure, and there was a breakdown in communication. Was that some of the stuff that you heard back from, from the focus groups? Um, yeah. And I mean, uh, the, just the plain methods of, of, of the communication, there were some questions about whether the surgeon had been called at all and, um, whether he had been paged, whether somebody had left the cath lab to run down the stairs to the OR in the hospital to let him know. And there was conflicting testimony between the interventionalist in the case and the surgeon. Um, you know, there's a little bit of he said, she said, or maybe a lot of he said, she said going on um, and unraveling that story really to get to the truth, to, to figure out how and why something like this occurs in a in a heart program for both adults and pediatric patients. It's just it's unacceptable. But, you know, we're trying to get to the truth about how can we prevent this in the future Right. From, from ever happening again. And so it's incredible because now as someone who, who is not familiar with these types of cases at all, it's resonating with me that a communication is key. And was that going to be kind of one of the focuses in your opening in the presentation of the evidence? I think the, the communication um, was going to be number one. Mm. Um, and, and in part because it, you know, it, as a theme throughout, it really did hit the diagnosis. There were issues about whether the surgeon had the right diagnosis, um, to, to treat it and to repair it with those textbook repairs we talked about. Um, he seemed and had testified that he was surprised at what he found with the anatomy, but in those, in those surgical cath conferences in the lead up to the surgery, uh, they had recommended tests to fully delineate and to map out the anatomy. And um, that that mapping word was word choice that we had come up with also from the that early focus group to, to say, look, you know, he needed a roadmap of this child's heart. Now, we think he had one from the medical records and from all of the 10, 11, 12 times it had been diagnosed. Uh, correctly. But they also said, get a diagnostic catheterization or a CT to fully map it out if you have questions. And the testimony was that the surgeon refused. Mm. And when he went in, uh, he testified that he was surprised at what he found. And, and so, you know, we were looping that back in to communication within those cath conferences uh, and and then taking that a step further with the hospital program itself to say, when you were needed, there were communication errors, um, really big ones about, you know, your whereabouts and whether you knew. And the surgeon said he didn't know, uh, but the interventionalist said uh, that's exactly what, she, you know, she had asked for. And there's a lot of folks in the cath lab who've got phone numbers and know where the surgeon is. 
And a lot of people sat idly by. What we do know is that the surgeon didn't show up for hours. You know, it's remarkable because you just made this case to me. Obviously, I'm biased, but very clear, right? And as someone who didn't really understand any of the specific medicine involved, it is now in my mind crystallized as there's just a straight line failure in the system of, of communicating across the board. And um, when you were running the focus groups, uh, what did that look like? Were, were you involved in, in handling those focus groups or did you have Rick or someone else at the office doing those? So we handled, Rick and I handled the first uh, couple on our own. We had taken a, a trial deposition of one of the key defendants early on and we were testing the that trial deposition um the and and presenting facts on the communication front to say here's a whole lot of information you you tell us what you think is important from that and and then just listening and facilitating the conversation um because and i did this up until the end you know i i would get bogged down in the details because i wanted that feedback of of here are the details what do you care about? What what we found in the later ones, uh, we had a jury consultant um, find out or, or obtain um, 10 to 12 jurors for us. This was on Zoom. And um, both Kent and I made presentations and then, and then listened and facilitated those conversations. Anytime we got into the medicine or, or anything else, um, it went over everybody's head. Everybody shut down, mm-hmm. and um, and it and it was too much. And I was guilty of that. And one of the good one of Rick's statements to me, I think, was, you know, we've got to keep it simple, and we've got to take it back to the communication. Yeah, but you're living, breathing, eating this, right? And I've been there, man. You're in the details. You know them. You you think I can articulate this very well, and um, just having that you know, you got a couple guys working on this case. It's, it's awesome to have, right? Just well, like, it's kind of, I mean, I, you know, you, we, we jokingly said that, I mean, truthfully, Kent and I, Kent thought that this case could surpass our verdict sure. by far. This case was a lot worse. Um, but, you know, to me, that's the thing, right? Adrian and Kent are the smart guys that dig into the medicine, get into the weeds and I'm not. I'm the guy who's like, okay, I, I kind of understand what y'all are talking about. Um, but at the same time, I'm the one who's saying, well, we're way off. I mean, we're, we're sitting here looking at a human heart model um, in this room. We're doing this call in uh, as the children's toy to, to show how blood flowed. And, and that thing didn't work well. But it was just such a complicated case that you had to really focus in on um, on the communication issue and how you could frame communication not only between uh, the doctors, but also what did the doctors actually tell the family, right? One of the big things that the folks groups showed was that if um, I, you know, if I know that I could have a heart, a, a, a heart procedure done for my child at a place that is more better equipped for that, as a parent, what are you going to do? You're going to choose to do it in Albuquerque or you're going to choose to do it in Denver where you know that there's a backup for it. And when that's not, when we played that as the communication a level of communication as well. Most parents did what what most parents would do and say, "Well, yeah, if they had told me that there were, if there was a problem, there was nobody there, then yeah, I would have gone somewhere else." Because ultimately, this child continues to be treated in Denver. So, yeah, you know, yeah. no, I mean, where was the communication of that? Right, and I, so I see this come up in uh, nursing home cases where they talk about, "Well, look, we're short staffed," and it and. I'll say, I understand that, but did you ever communicate that to people you were still bringing in as new patients? And did you ever give them the option? And so that seems to resonate with me, but I'm a lot like Adrian. I get lost in the weeds and having just other people to bounce it off of like, like you, Rick, good, you know, great communicator, I think speaks to the importance of having other people involved. Got to have the team. I think if you're going to be handling cases uh, and and digging this deep into them to develop them on the foundational level, 
and to continue building and to continue building to get it ready for trial, that that doing it alone is um, it's it's also, it's impossible. I think yeah. there there are you know there's too much and and for something to get you know lost or to slip through the cracks, um, especially when you're representing a you know a paraplegic brain injured child, it's just you got to have a team. And in, in terms of the um, r- result, I don't know if you can share that or not, but you you did have, um, you were able to make sure that this child was cared for for the rest rest of the child's life. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yes. So I, that is fair to say. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, and like Rick said, you guys felt like this was going to be another record setter because of the facts i think that the you know the the interplay and the adversarial nature between the two defendants Mm. was uh was helpful and it's strategically something that uh i tried to develop uh throughout the case and and when that came to fruition through their own experts um you know there was there was really no place for them to run or hide other than to blame each other and and ultimately our um position was that the hospital system was responsible for all of it so so they've got to buy this um uh you know these bad facts that are coming from the cath lab and from the surgery and you know, there's there's one entity that's responsible, and that's the, the the big system in place that they started to treat children with heart conditions. Uh, how long did you litigate this case? How how long did the case go on in, in the office? Five years. Yeah. Yeah. And you're you're living it, and then is Rick coming in and saying, "Let's let's go back to ten thousand foot." Because I'm already seeing some of these rabbit holes that I could run down when you're talking about getting the defendants to break a pull stick and fight each other and stuff. And t- Rick saying, come on, let's back up. A, a lot of that came out in in the strategy behind the depositions and um, this, you know, having discussions with even opposing counsel about what my strategy is going to be. Now, mm-hmm. it's the only case I've ever had where I was open with opposing counsel and letting them know this is the path I'm going to take. Um, And I think there were opportunities for them to recognize, well, that may help my client. And if it helps my client, then I'm doing my job. And um, to the extent that you're going to exploit that, you know, Mr. Vega against the other defendant, well, I, you know, I may need to go along with you on that. And so that was fun. The depositions in this case were fun. The testimony was fun. Ultimately, um, even if I believed that some of the information I got was going to be excluded, well, the judge is seeing all of it. And the the judge is, is ruling on motions saying, okay, defendant. So defendant one here has an expert who is blaming defendant number two, saying that if you'd done this, None of this would have ever happened. And defendant, you know, is saying, well, but they never told us that they had that their expert had these opinions. And we feel like it's, it was a surprise. And, um, you know, whether it gets excluded or not is different when one of the defendants experts is saying the exact same thing our experts are saying. Um, so so that aspect of it was fun. Yeah, I bet. Um, I'm I'm just blown away. I mean, you guys continue to do. Uh, just amazing things for your clients. Um, and I, I think your clients that you, you have are so fortunate to have you. you. You're two of the top lawyers I know, and I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast to to talk about this case. Well, I want to really applaud Adrian because obviously he came over with this case. So for two years, he or two and a half years, he carried the water yeah. on this by himself. Um, and so when he came, this was one of the cases that he and I talked about um, having a cigar on his back patio 
um, and it was his baby. And so I knew that it was important to him um, to have a good outcome. And so when it became, you know, all hands on deck to get ready, we all, um, we all threw in um, with the understanding that this was, this was an important case. Um, once we got to know the case, we understood how important it was, but for Adrian, it's been important since the day he, he walked in the door and we put his name, um, on the sign. So for us, it was, it's a, it's a great culmination. Um, it's nice to put it to rest because the family is, is going to be able to, to take care of some things to really help them, um, get even the living conditions that this child needs. Um, but there's, you know, there's still lo- another component. So we may need to have another talk about, about it on, on a weird, uh, issue in New Mexico. Um, but we can, we can talk over that over, a, over a glass the next, next time we see each other and see how that works out. Love it. Glass and some cigars. And I mean, as, as someone who knows the importance of having good lawyers represent a family, thank you. Thank you. You, you guys outstanding work. If, Someone were wanting to reach out to you and talk to you about a, a similar type of case or any type of case in your neck of the woods. Um, what's the best way to get a hold of you? And they can call. They can uh, give us, you know, shoot me an email, shoot Rick an email, call the firm. We're happy to happy to talk or happy to help or share ideas with with uh, with anybody on the plaintiff side. I'll throw both of those in the show notes. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for having us. You're listening to the Case Autopsy, the Verdict and Settlement Podcast. Podcast. This is Mike Campbell. So I got to be honest uh, with everyone listening. Um, those guys are just really, really good at what they do. And um, I could probably have gone on for hours with them. But obviously, we, we want to try to keep these as uh, tight as possible. So uh, uh, I hope everyone learned a lot. Gus, did you learn a lot? Yeah. Yeah. Those are communication, right? Right. Communication is key. That's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. If you're Especially if you're doing something as serious as working or trying to uh, help um, a little baby, you're tr- you want to make sure that uh, all the doctors are communicating, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to be able to take the medicine and, and just crystallize it into that specific theme and topic, I think speaks very highly of, of both Adrian and Rick. And, um, so hope everyone got a lot out of this podcast. Uh, like I said, next time, hopefully we'll be joined with the one and only, uh, Chris Finney. Um, he'll hopefully go get another big verdict and we'll be able to talk about both of those. Um, We have a few more podcasts coming up over the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned. Thanks again for joining us. That concludes another episode of Case Autopsy, the verdict and settlement podcast, part of the Lawyer Minds ecosystem. Thank you for listening, and we truly hope it was worth your time. Please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Explore the other content that Lawyer Minds has to offer and engage with us on social media. Your feedback and ideas are always welcomed. See you next time.